All right. Hey, everyone. I am uh, Adam Johnson. I'm from uh, Mitokura. And uh, we are providing uh, network virtualization. Uh, our project is called MitoNet. And uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a use case uh, in particular, which is managed pri private clouds, uh, in particular for enterprises uh, using OpenStack and network virtualization. Uh, so you know, before we start, I just kind of want to see how many of you have heard of uh, MitoNet or MitoKura before? Can you raise your hand? Actually, quite a few. OK, great. Um, so I'm, we're not going to cover an overview. You know, there's plenty of other places uh, this week where you can get more of a deep dive on MitoNet itself. But basically, just the high-level overview uh, you know, is that MitoNet is providing you know, layer 2 through 4 networking services for Neutron. So we have a plug-in. It's fully open source. Uh, and it's essentially you know, simplifying Neutron, making it more scalable and performant, and covering more advanced use cases. And you know, some of these use cases uh, are definitely going to be talked about today uh, by Matsuno-san, who's from KVH. Um, so I'll, I'll let him start off, and then uh, he'll talk about his use cases uh, at KVH. And then we can uh, then later talk about some of the advanced functionality that we're building into MitoNet uh, as a response to some of the issues that they came across. And then we can open it up for Q&A after that. So I'll hand it off to Matsuno-san. OK, thank you, Adam. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to join our session. Uh, my name is Matsuno. I'm an architect for cloud and managed service in KVH. Today, I'll talk about you know, our experience with OpenStack and MitoNet. This is the agenda from my talk. <coughs> Uh, first of all, I will briefly introduce uh, who is KVH, and then I will talk about what is enterprise, what is our target customers, and then what was the challenge when we were going into the production, and what we did, and what we make sure, what we have tested, and then what we approach to the customer, and the customer has some uh, requirements through their uh, proposal. <coughs> okay, this is about KVH. Uh, we are founded uh, by Fidelity Group uh, investment company in 1999 uh, in Tokyo. Uh, started uh, from uh, telecom business, uh, Metro Ethernet. Uh, then we built uh, data centers, uh, high quality data centers uh, in Tokyo. Uh, then on top of that, uh, we uh, start to provide managed service. And then uh, December last year, uh, we acquired by Colt. It's our group company, and then also established by the Fidelity in 1992, uh, London. Now we are together, and now we have our uh, reachability to Asia and Europe. And this is our service portfolio, uh, network service, and data centers, and managed service, and cloud. This is our target, what is enterprises. Uh, Enterprise is uh, different. Uh, definition is a bit different from uh, tech savvy companies. They don't have a lot of uh, engineering resources to babysitting their IT infrastructure. But uh, they have a lot of pressure uh, from uh, you know, the business side, uh, CapEx, uh, OPEX reduction, or time to market. As the Jonathan mentioned in this morning keynote, uh, for example, the Alba case, a taxi company is uh, really suffering uh, by the software. Uh, and then also, uh, the virtualization and the public cloud is like a default choice for enterprise. Uh, the situation is getting uh, challenging every day. So we service provider, like KVH, have to help those enterprises with our private cloud. <laughs> so this is a checklist checklist and what we can provide to the enterprises as our managed private cloud solution. And then we choose the OpenStack for the platform. I don't have to explain why we choose OpenStack in this room. But we, a service provider, can have a lot of choices with OpenStack. That's the biggest advantage. So however, there are challenges. Uh, before going to the production uh, to us. Uh, capacity planning and performance validation after deployment and 24 by 7 support to the customer and then root cause analysis troubleshooting. And the, one of the biggest uh, challenges is you know, stability on the networking. Uh, when we decide to go with OpenStack, uh, Neutron, 
uh, is not so uh, stable, and especially in a network node, redundancy, high availability is quite sensitive. Uh, and another challenge is uh, H uh, high availability on a controller. So without those you know, requirements uh, will be satisfied, we cannot say, you know, yes, we, yes, we, we are 100% confident uh, with our managed, managed private cloud. So then this is our choice. We choose Midonet for networking, and we choose Mirantes for uh, control HA. So the reason why we choose Midonet is uh, their architecture is really scalable, and then there is no single point of failure. And then they are aligned with OpenStack, and 100% commit to the Neutron. The Mirantes uh, ha already has uh, more than 100 uh, deployment experiences, and they have a certain, uh, you know, the architecture for controller. This is a comparison chart uh, between uh, Midonet and the other solutions. Uh, as you can see on the top, uh, the OBS uh, kind of default choice for Neutron uh, doesn't su uh, support those requirements. Uh, it's really difficult to uh, have tier three support uh, in the, with uh, immediate action. We cannot wait the feedback from community uh, because customer business is stopping. We have to take care right away. <coughs> so however, Midonet uh, is a scalable and then no single point failure, then it's really reliable. And then also uh, the other uh, solution uh, uh, provided by the other vendor for Neutron. It's also supported, you know, the uh, kind of uh, reliability and the scalability and the support. But since our product is private cloud, it's not large scale, it's not for the uh, public cloud. So we should minimize our overhead uh, node, uh, overhead, you know, computer resources. And then Minonet is really compact, but, uh, you know, it's well fun functional. That's why we choose Minonet. Why Mirantes? Mirantes covered almost uh, all those uh, requirements. So that's why we chose Mirantes for the distribution. So this is what we have validated uh, after we decide to go with Midonet and uh, Mirantes. And there are 15 uh, bare metal servers, uh, not virtual, all physical, and they installed uh, Mirantes OpenStack and Midonet. And we installed the Safe as well. And then uh, there, there are uh, two Arista switches uh, for the public, and then Cisco switches for layer three function. This is what we have test uh, for the layer three uh, gateway uh, on the Midonet. Uh, in a, we can uh, access to the public uh, network uh, through the Midonet layer three gateway. Midonet layer three gateway support BGP. And then uh, BGP, uh, with BGP, we can have uh, uh, redundancy and the uh, uh, load balancing, uh, traffic load balancing. And the once the one uh, pair is uh, go down, uh, the traffic is fail over uh, with uh, almost zero impact. And we try, uh, we tested uh, different failure scenarios, and in any case, uh, the result is the same. And for layer two networking, uh, since there, uh, there is a limitation on the layer two, so we can have, we can have the only one active path. Uh, there is a not active active. This is a active standby. So one uh, VLAN, the specific network, uh, can use the only one path. So that's a layer two limitation. So then, but uh, failover is working pretty well. Uh, it's predictable, uh, and then we can, you know, the, uh, understand this is a, a layer two, and there is a limitation. But the problem with this is that, you know, the uh, once the uh, failover happening and the failback happening, and there is two downtimes. If the switch is rebooting again and again, interface flapping, the network is going to be uh, uh, flapping as well. So this area have to be improved, improved, but it's typical layer two, uh, typical behavior. So we can control oh, this point. And this is a, a high-level architecture for control HA. 
As I mentioned, we use Milan Test uh, OpenStack, so we can you can access uh, to the op, uh, Milan Test website uh, for more detail. But we tried uh, uh, every controller node failure, but it's not easy to break. Uh, it's well uh, configured and optimized with uh, uh, pacemaker, call sync, and HA proxy. So Minonet database uh, with Cassandra and Zookeeper is coexist on the control node. OK. So this is a, a customer voice. Uh, when we pitch to the product to the market, uh, we have some feedback from customer. And customer is uh, want to start from start, uh, start from a small environment, and then scale out. Because they don't want to uh, spend money uh, in, uh, at the beginning, uh, from day one, then they would like to scale out. And then there another concern is you know, uh, the upgrade of uh, their OpenStack. Uh, since the release cycle of OpenStack is very quick, uh, they are worried about you know, how to upgrade my OpenStack. And then interoperability uh, with uh, legacy system or uh, current systems is also they are required. Uh, once they are, we have OpenStack uh, environment, uh, it should be connected to uh, their firewall or the load balancer, the how to do that. And the monitoring, how to monitor the uh, tenant, and then how to handling the alert, or how to have uh, billing data uh, from the OpenStack. Uh, those requirements is coming in from customers. And then this is uh, uh, how to scale out the computer and the storage. There are two options. One is just uh, enhance the computer and the storage node within the same OpenStack environment. The option two is having another region. If the uh, uh, current OpenStack environment is uh, getting busy, uh, so our recommendation is uh, option two, uh, because it's uh, already well designed and then cookie cutter and predictable. But uh, in case of the option one, and when the uh, resource is growing and node is growing, then load average and then uh, to the controller and the OpenStack process is getting higher. And we have to carefully uh, monitor those resources. But option two is really predictable. So that's why, uh, as of today, I recommend to go to the option two. So how to scale network? Uh, since Midonet using BGP, it's really easy to scale out. Uh, we can add more layer three gateway nodes, and we can have more BGP PR or interface or uh, layer, uh, BGP routers if you want. And then traffic is multi-passed. And easy, the failover is pre, uh, working. Layer two, layer two also can uh, scale out, but as I mentioned, uh, since this is uh, there is a limitation of layer two, we can have only one active path for one network. So we can uh, have a more uh, layer two node, uh, but we have to uh, control the VLAN ID. Uh, for the traffic expansion. <clears throat> so this is how to upgrade my OpenStack. So there is two options as well. Uh, it is it's similar to the uh, how to scale computer uh, storage, no uh, storage node. Option one is uh, using a rolling upgrade. We put new uh, controller cluster with a newer version, and then using uh, uh, a rolling upgrade. So option two is having another region with a newer version. Then once, newer, uh, once the new version of region is up and running and stable, getting stable, we can migrate uh, uh, compute resources from uh, current region to new region. This is more predictable, and then as I mentioned, it's cookie cutter design. And then once the uh, uh, current computer node from uh, uh, current computer resource from original node is the uh, migrated to the uh, new region, then we can upgrade. 
Uh, this slide shows the uh, uh, several patterns about how to connect uh, customer existing environment to the OpenStack environment. Then scenario one is customer can use uh, enjoy 100%, uh, enjoy the NFB 100%. So option two, a customer cannot uh, give away uh, the uh, box type firewall. Option three, customer cannot uh, give up both uh, firewall and universal box. So I will uh, show you the detail of on each of case. So option one, so it's very simple. We don't have to worry about you know interoperability with uh, physical box via our load balancer. We can enjoy the NFB uh, load balancer uh, with the LBARS uh, pro given by the Midonet a layer for uh, based load balance, very simple. Uh, and the security, we can, we can have a security group. If customer want to have a layer seven, seven level load balancing, customer can put virtual load balancer into their tenant. Option two, customer cannot uh, give away their uh, physical firewall, firewall box. In this scenario, uh, the uh, traffic between the computer node uh, and the internet and the external network have to go through the uh, physical firewall. In this scenario, the so IP address allocation for floating uh, as a floating IP to the each VM have to control have to be controlled by firewall. So then, certain IP address range have to be properly forwarded to the certain firewall and the certain uh, tenants. So then, source-based routing or policy-based routing is required on the layer three core switch. So in this scenario, we should talk to the customer carefully, and we should test with this environment carefully. Option three, so customer cannot uh, give away both firewall and load balancer box. In this case, it's really difficult to have uh, uh, benefit with the uh, MidNet layer three gateway. Uh, so in, uh, as an alternative, we can use layer two gateway. So with VLAN and a cloud environment and the physical box uh, connected uh, through the VLAN. Uh, but in the scenario, the traffic between tenant and then public internet have to be controlled by physical boxes. Uh, most of cases by manual. And then if the, those physical box uh, will have the uh, Elbas plugin, maybe we can uh, uh, control through the horizon. But this area uh, need to be improved in probability. So this is wrap up for my uh, part. So we choose reliable and proven network and controller for private cloud. And there is a wish list uh, for future release. Hope sometime soon. Uh, layer to failover reliability improvement and easy to upgrade my OpenStack. And more dynamic interoperability with appliance boxes. And the billing tool, monitoring tool, audit tool, tools, those features need to be improved. Now we are treated as a professional service. We are writing a script uh, giving to the customer. Uh, but if the uh, OpenStack project uh, improved those areas, so it'd be uh, great to the customer. So we are all ears. So if uh, someone in this room has a better answer, please talk to me. Thank you. And I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to share a few slides here just to show some. Um, some kind of tech preview stuff that we have in MediaNet. Some of this is, is uh, being built to address some of the issues. Not all of the issues uh, are being addressed yet, um, but this is, this is what we're working towards. Um, so just a quick high level you know, blurb. You know, again, we're basically doing the layer two through four uh, networking services. In a distributed system, uh, we essentially are replacing OVS agent uh, with a MediaNet agent. Uh, and the MediaNet agent is basically providing much higher layer services um, than just standard OVS vSwitch could provide. Um, so that's why we, were re we why we replace it. And then we just talk directly to the Linux kernel 
Um, so these Metanet agents running on every compute host are essentially um, providing this distributed networking service. So wherever you're running one, that compute host has the ability to run all of the services from distributed routing, distributed NAT, security groups, uh, layer four load balancing, and so on. Um, it does get certainly tricky when you start putting in layer seven or, or physical appliances. Um, so we do kind of expose some uh, more advanced functionalities that the Neutron API doesn't have today. Um, for example, we have access to the full routing tables. We can do uh, kind of source-based routing or policy-based routing uh, and filters on, on these as well. Um, so you have a lot more fine-grained control uh, for these kind of custom scenarios that you probably run into if you're uh, an enterprise uh, user. So we have several um, customers and users of Metonet. Um, they range from um, kind of the software as a service or web 2.0 type companies like Getty Images um, to the public clouds like Oro, which is a, a Canada-based uh, public cloud, to some enterprises as well, like uh, Dell IT, for example, is, uh, is building an internal IT cloud using Metonet. Uh, and then on the tech partners, you know, we work, we work with uh, basically all of the OpenStack distros. So KVH has chosen Mirantis, and we have several customers using them. We have several customers using uh, Canonical and Red Hat as well. Um, so we see you know, all kinds of different distros being in use. And on the hardware networking side, um, while we are an overlay and we don't typically care about what's running on the physical network, you, know, you could run Cisco boxes or Dell uh, networking switches. It doesn't matter. Uh, we are building advanced functionality into some capable uh, switches that are out there, which I'll talk about. Um, six months ago in Paris, uh, at the Paris Summit, we actually open sourced all of our software. Um, we made a pretty huge move to do this. Um, we had spent you know, four years building the technology, and we open sourced it all on GitHub. Apache license, same license as OpenStack. Um, and you know, the reason we did this was because we wanted to provide an open solution for a Neutron plugin that's you know, production grade, very easy to use out of the box, because we continually see people struggling with uh, deploying OpenStack when it comes to Neutron, um, making it HA, making it scalable. You know, there's a lot of moving components in, in, in Neutron. Um, so Metonet aims to kind of simplify that dramatically while you know, future-proofing you for your scaling as well. So that's our intent. Um, we're hoping to see a lot more adoption. You know, the user survey just came out, and we're starting to see us rise up those charts a little bit. Um, and we're hoping in six months' time, you know, we'll see another rise um, uh, in the networking space as well. Um, and basically, Mitokura, who I work for, basically is providing a enterprise version of Mitonet. So you can you know, go to GitHub or metanet.org and use the open source version today. You can download it. There's many ways to get started with it. And then Mitokura provides basically a downstream enterprise version that we've hardened and tested. And uh, we build some, um, some advanced management tools on top. For example, we have a graphical user interface, uh, which is providing some advanced functionality, which I'll, I'll give a preview of. Um, so these are the kind of enhancements that we're working on right now. Some of these are being released in our next version, which we're announcing this week. Um, and some of these are coming in the next version. So these are all kind of short-term uh, things that are down the pipe, uh, which some of these, I think, will address what, uh, what KVH is, is uh, running into. And a lot of the other ones we're running into are when it comes into operational, uh, you know, when, you, when you're operating a cloud uh, along the networking and you're using uh, an overlay, whether it's us or anyone else, OVS plugin, it's very hard to troubleshoot networking for many reasons. Um, so we're looking for ways to make that as easy as possible. Um, so these are some of the first steps. So one of the complaints about the layer two gateway uh, you know, is a software-based gateway, uh, and you can run an active standby. This is available currently. Um, you know, it will let you connect into a VLAN. The problem is you know, it has a failover time, maybe one to five seconds. That may or may not be an issue for you. Um, and it also has a, you, know, you have only a certain number of ports that you can have on an on a x86 server today. Um, so we did build in um, what we call VTAP, or VXLAN hardware gateway support. So there are some switches out there like, uh, that basically are using the Broadcom Trident 2 chipset, which we can program remotely and turn into a hardware layer 2 gateway. Um, the current version of Metanet has an active standby model there. Um, so it's still going to have some failover time 
uh, when one of those switches goes out. Um, but we are building an active-active model right now. Uh, and this is something we're actually building with Cumulus Linux. Um, I don't know if, how many people have heard of Cumulus before. Some of you. So, so basically, Cumulus Linux is a, a switch operating system that installs on switches. So you can buy a switch from Dell or HP or um, Edge Core or many other vendors today, uh, typically white box or bright box cheap switches, top of rack switches. And you can now start to choose the operating system you want to run on that. So you may want to use like a Dell networking operating system, which was Force 10, or you may want to use a Cumulus. And you know, Dell, for example, is starting to um, offer you know, up to seven switch operating systems. So switches are kind of turning into servers where the hardware and the software don't have to be connected to each other. I don't have to buy a switch from a particular vendor and be locked into the operating system. Uh, so Cumulus has kind of been one of the early movers in that space. And basically, they're providing a Debian-based Linux on top of your switch. So you SSH into it, and it's essentially Debian. Uh, and what they do is you know, they're providing the magic of connecting into the ASICs. So when you are running any networking in it, it's actually being held, hap it's all happening in the, in the Broadcom chipsets. So we are working with Cumulus um, on their next version and our um, upcoming version uh, to, to basically provide active-active uh, hardware layer two gateways. So this will essentially allow us to program top of rack switches, run them in active-active mode, and this is using basically an MLAG. So this is, this is actually vendor specific. So we're starting with Cumulus and we'll work with other vendors because everyone implements MLAG differently, unfortunately. Um, so for active standby, this could work on many different vendors. Uh, it's not vendor specific, but for active active, it will be. Um, but this is something that we're building, which could hopefully address some of the issues that KVH has. Um, for the troubleshooting tools, you know, this is something that comes up a lot with people starting to go into production uh, more and more. They're running into issues, and they want to be able to have more visibility into the network. Um, so we're starting to put together some more uh, tools to make this as easy as possible to troubleshoot or just to get a, a view of what's going on. So what this is is a, just a screenshot of our uh, MetaNet manager, which is uh, part of the enterprise version. And basically, uh, we're, pr we're providing aggregated metrics uh, in MetaNet. Open source MetaNet provides aggregated metrics. We're putting this into a time series database, and then we're graphing this uh, uh, in our GUI. So when you click on a router, a logical router, or a, or a logical bridge, which would be like a neutron network or a subnet, uh, you're going to see an aggregated view of the traffic uh, coming in, out of, in and out of that device. You're also going to see spark lines for all of the ports. Uh, you can do this on the physical host as well, so you can see the traffic in aggregate going through the hosts. Um, and this gives you a good idea of, is traffic flowing through a gateway right now? Uh, or if you have a certain um, tenant that's being um, uh, much more active than others. You can you know, look at all of the tenant routers and see which one has the most traffic. So you can see which tenant uh, is being attacked. So many ways to do this, but we are looking for as easy a ways to provide this kind of information uh, with the, as few clicks and commands as possible. The other one that uh, we have uh, offered, you know, previously in, in MetoNet, we had a tool, a virtual trace route tool. So basically, in the command line, you could run mm trace and you set some uh, some rule, uh, basically, or some filter. So you say, I want to see a trace for traffic that's you know, destined for 8888 or something like this, right? Uh, and then we'll show you, you know, what that simulation would look like in MetaNet, going through every step of the logical topology, how the packets are transformed, and if it was dropped or forwarded. Um, previously, you had to log in to each compute host individually and run this command to get the results of it. It's a little bit cumbersome because in an overlay, there's two sides, right? You have the compute host and you have the gateway. If it's going out or if it's going between two compute hosts, there's two sides. So you'd have to log in and run two different traces to see both ends of that. It's kind of slow and cumbersome and not great for networking ops teams at all. Um, so we decided to make this a uh, centralized uh, tool. So we built this into the GUI. And basically, now you can you know, easily create and define different filters. Uh, or different trace requests. Um, so you can see you know, just an example here. You can have access to basically all of the uh, elements of a layer 4 tuple uh, and, and create, uh, create traces this way. You create it. You hit Start. It will collect some specific specified number of traces across the entire system. And then it's going to display the results 
of the trace. So this is an ex example of one trace that we could see uh, where it's going to show going through every single hop uh, of the virtual network. You know, and, and this hop is essentially one happening in one physical box. So Meta is essentially providing um, this network simulation, which goes through all of these steps, going through routing between tenants, providing uh, floating IPs and security groups, uh, all in a single hop. So it's not bouncing off of physical boxes or VMs to do this. Uh, and this is essentially giving you the results of that uh, in a very simple to read, you know, uh, comparatively, you know, you, if you're looking at debug logs, it's going to be kind of hard to parse. So this is much easier to, to look at very quickly and tell, you know, successfully created flow. Great. So I, I know that logically this should be working. If it's not reaching the other end, if I don't see the matching flow in here, then I know that maybe there's a problem on the physical network between those two hosts. Uh, so I can start looking at that. And another thing we're starting to do is provide flow history. Um, so we have all of this access to this data, uh, and we're building a, this is, a, this is a coming in a future version, um, which is pretty soon. But basically, we're able to send all of the flow data to a centralized uh, data store. Uh, the demo that we've done so far is using Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and Kibana, or Elk, uh, and basically sending the data to a centralized uh, Elastics uh, Logstash cluster, uh, where it's storing all of this in aggregate. And then Kibana is the graphical user interface. This is an open source project. Uh, and this is the Kibana interface that you're seeing here. So what we're looking at here is uh, essentially a graph of all of the flows across the system. You can apply filters. So I can say, show me all the uh, flows that belong to this particular tenant or belong to this particular host or are destined for this particular IP address. You can you know, mix and match however you like. It's very powerful. Uh, and you can look at uh, the time frames. You can zoom in on a particular time frame. You can actually use this to find the exact flow that you're looking for historically. So if you have a user who calls you up and says, hey, you know, I lost my connection 30 minutes ago. What was going on? You could actually use this tool to look back 30 minutes and find that exact flow and see what happened. Uh, and the result will be the entire flow data. So you'll get all of this data. Uh, and you'll be able to figure out what happened. If it was uh, dropped intentionally, uh, if someone added a security group rule, for example, you can kind of use this to deduce uh, these types of things, which are kind of common um, operational you know, uh, situations that you might run into. Um, and we're going to take this data. Uh, and so this is in Logstash, but the, the enterprise version we're going to store into Cassandra and use Spark to do analytics on it. And we're going to put that into our GUI and, and make it much more contextual. So you see all of these UUIDs here. That's because Kibana does not know what those UUIDs equate to, but we do. So we can start uh, connecting those to other data in the system. And if you hover over the UUID, you'll see the, the resource uh, that it belongs to and get all of the data without jumping back and forth. Um, so we're going to be demoing this kind of stuff uh, at our booth uh, you know, from tomorrow. So if you're interested in seeing this live, uh, you know, our booth is T7. So you can definitely stop by and, and check that out. And we'll be there tonight at the, uh, at the booth crawl as well. So now we're opening it up for questions for, for either of us. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, what was the time series database that you were initially targeting? Uh, it's uh, Prometheus, which is from the SoundCloud guys. Okay. So we, ha we have a blog post. Um, if you go to blog.metonet.org, there's a post on how to actually set it up. Um, it's very cool. Very cool. It has uh, events and alerts and all kinds of stuff. Any other questions? It's hard to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, right now, basically, we're, uh, we're not putting a lot of um, control plane data into Cassandra. Most of it's going into ZooKeeper. Um, but yeah, it definitely could be going into a separate cluster, you know, if, especially if, you, uh, if your data retention policy is you, know, you want to store a ton of data. This could fill up very quickly. Um, so it could definitely be sent to a separate cluster for that purpose. It would, it would make sense to do so, yeah. Any other questions? It's hard to see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Um, so, so basically, uh, all of the APIs and the, the interfaces are being exposed through the open source project. So for example, for the, for the um, metrics aggregation, we put it into Prometheus, which is another open source project. Um, so those could definitely be brought into other tools like Manage IQ, no problem. Um, we're, we're designing them to basically be very generic and pluggable to whatever tools you use. Hello, uh, I got a question. Uh, you mentioned the physical server support, uh, uh, and you mentioned that you are working together with Cumulus Linux uh, to support it. Does it mean that you are going to implement some specific feature into, into Cumulus Linux, or are you binding the support on some specific protocol? Uh, might it be OVSDB or, or whatever? How yes. do you implement this support? Good question. So. Um, for the current VTEP functionality, we're using OVSDB. So it should work across any of the switches supporting OVSDB. But for the active active, um, the only way we can achieve that currently is by using MLAG. So MLAG is designed differently between every single vendor, because it's not a standard. Um, so for that functionality, it's going to be Cumulus specific. Um, and we are looking at building um, more features into switch fabrics. You know, this is, these tools are great. They're providing us visibility into the overlay, but no visibility into the underlay. Um, so we are working on, uh, we're working with Cumulus Linux initially to build uh, a, a switch agent that will run inside of Cumulus Linux and can provide you know, metrics and, and uh, uh, congestion detection and reporting and things like this from the physical network. Um, initially, we were working with Cumulus because we have a lot of joint users and we like working with those guys, but it should be something that's not just tied to one distro, so we're looking at all of the other ones that are out there, like Pika 8, and there's some others that are uh, starting to come out. Um, so we're looking at those and seeing, based on customer traction, how we should prioritize working with them all. But that's kind of what we're thinking. Uh, any plans to support uh, Pluribus networks or Cisco for this? Um, we're open to uh, talking to all those guys, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Okay. Any, uh, that's it. Great. So thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.